Welcome to this episode of Nature Positivity, the podcast where we chat about all the fun things that happen in the natural world over a cup of tea. I'm Holly. And I'm Karis. And for this episode, we're joined by Dr Louise Gentle. Do you have a cup of tea or a hot drink with you? Yes, I've got my usual cup of decaf tea with a little bit of sugar in it. (laughs) Do you, Holly? I do not this time, unfortunately. I plan on having one after the episode, though. Do you, Karis? I've got a cup of coffee today. So a bit different. <laughs> you have to change the name, Nature Positive yeah. Coffee. It just, it's not got the same it flow to it. It hasn't. <laughs> I've been teaching as a lecturer at Nottingham Trent University for the past 18 years. Uh, so I've led the course in wildlife conservation, but now I am in charge of all of the conservation courses here. So we've got ecology and conservation, wildlife conservation, and the foundation degree in wildlife conservation as well. And my specialisms in terms of research are behavioural ecology and ornithology. So anything to do with the behaviour of virtually any animal, uh, but I particularly like birds. The last episode that we did was just about us. So we were the guests on the episode and some of the things that we talked about were our undergraduate degrees and it kind of turned into a little bit of a competition to see whose degree was the best. And I feel like I'm in a bit of an advantage here because... Louise, you were a past lecturer of mine at uni, so it's kind of like two against one today. (laughs) Yeah, 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 definitely. Holly's wildlife conservation degree is the best. Yeah, that's it. End of. No more, (laughs) no more arguing about it. That's fact. (laughs) It is. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) So we're kind of focusing this episode on mating and sex in the animal kingdom. So a bit of a different one this week. Would you be able to explain perhaps how animals decide who to mate with? I imagine it differs depending on the species, but the main example that springs to my mind as entering the rutting season is the fights that male deer have at this time of year. Is that to try to win a mate or mates? Yes. So um, we kind of make one assumption in the animal kingdom, and that is that all species, so not humans, so humans fall outside of this because we're capable of critical, independent thinking. So we can choose whether we want to mate or not, whether we want to reproduce, that kind of thing. But generally, we assume that all animals in the animal kingdom want to survive long enough to be able to pass their genes on to the next generation. So we're assuming then that every individual individual wants to mate and they want to produce the best quality offspring possible. So they're trying to live long enough to be able to pass on as many offspring as they possibly can. So that's really to do with all the the spread of genes and natural selection and passing on to the next generation. So if we make that assumption, basically all individuals are wanting to mate and they're wanting to mate with the best partner. So there's lots of competition there. It's particularly males that are competing for access to females, but in some species it's the other way around. And this is to do with something called anisogamous sex. So this is where the males have got lots and lots of fast tiny sperm that can be replenished over their whole lifespan whereas females have just got a finite number of eggs and the eggs are generally large compared to the sperm and passive so they're not mobile really so because of this the females have got this resource which is really restricted and so the males are all trying to compete to gain access to those eggs and then pass on their genes in that way so this is why you end up with loads of males competing like the deer in the rutting season they're all competing they've evolved massive antlers or other weapons depending on the species and they're all trying to fight to say you know i'm the most dominant one if i'm the most dominant one then that means i'm going to get access to all of the ladies so they're kind of putting themselves in the lineup with other males so they're showing off to the females look I'm better than all of these other males here but they're also showing the other males I'm better than all of you because I've got these massive antlers But the females get some element of choice as well. Sometimes the females are actively choosing a particular male, or in the case of things like the deer, then the females, I suppose the male is chosen for them, but the females know they've got the best quality male there. Other than the deer example, do you have other examples where males fight to win a mate? And can it get even worse, and can it be a fight to the death? 
Oh yeah, loads of examples. So almost all species, the males are fighting to get access to the females. So because of this, there's a huge number of weapons that have evolved. So you've got the antlers in the deer, you've got various horns, so things like stag beetles. They will use those to fight with other beetles. They'll even use them to prize males off females. If they're mid-copulation, they can use the, the horn that they've got to basically prize them off, chuck them off, and then they can jump on. So loads of things. Uh, there's things like spurs. So these are almost claws at the back of things like cockerels or, or jungle fowl. Uh, there, there's just a, a huge number of weapons, almost everything you can think of. Wow. Is there any situation where it's kind of the other way around and where the females perhaps compete? Or maybe there's an interesting behaviour or interaction between males and females that you can think of? Yeah, there are quite a few examples where it's the females that are fighting for access to males. Uh, so these tend to be, the background to that is where the males tend to do more of the rearing of the offspring. So they've invested more. So usually it's the females investing more with those large eggs. But if the males are looking after the offspring, brooding them, maybe like in the seahorses where the males actually give birth, then that's the case where you've got the females fighting over access. Uh, so uh, button quails, so really quite tiny birds, uh, a bit like our own qu quails or, or things like that, they will fight and they will uh, scratch each other with their claws, like proper bitch fight they will have. So just you're scrabbling at each other so that they can get access to the males. Yeah, there, there are lots of examples like that. And as you mentioned earlier about things fighting to the death, that happens all the time, particularly in the males, but it will also happen in the females, so they would fight to the death, yeah. Amazing. I was going to say, because I imagine it's quite costly, if, if you take the deer example, to grow the antlers and things like that, and it would make sense how you were saying how the females, if they're fighting for a male, it's more likely to be the males that are going to rear the offspring because that's also very costly to them. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So the male, the things like the deer, and often in a few other species, there's lots of different ways that they're asserting their dominance. So fighting is just, if nothing else has worked, then they will engage in the fight, because the fights are so costly and the fights could result in injury or even death. So they will start off, it's a thing called sequential assessment. So the deers will start off, uh, so they might be roaring. So roaring where they're almost like, woo, woo, woo that's an indication of how big they are. So the deeper the roar or the longer the roar indicates that they are larger and they've got more stamina, so they should be a better, higher quality male. If two males are equally matched in terms of their roaring, then they'll escalate to the next stage. So the next stage for the males is where they will do a parallel walk. So they will both walk side by side, sizing each other up, so they've got a better idea of the size of them. And again, if they're equally matched, then they'll escalate to the full-on fighting. So it, it, they're trying to avoid fighting as much as possible because it is so costly. But what they're really after is getting those mating. So it does put a lot of energy into growing things like the antlers, which is why we called them an honest signal. So in most cases, quite a lot of things like uh, plumage in birds or the, the brightness of certain pelage and things like, um, well, particularly things like primates or, or any other mammal, uh, this is all an indication of the quality of the males. So if they've been feeding well, if they're in tip-top condition, only then can they produce this amazing honest signal for the females to be able to choose them on. Yeah, but the main thing is they are just desperate to pass on their genes to the next generation. So, and in the case of quite a lot of the males, they've just got to do the job and then they can go off down to the pub or something. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned honest signals. Is there such a thing as dishonest signals? Maybe they're just tricking the females? Yeah, there are plenty of dishonest signals. So wherever there's honesty, then there's been the evolution of dishonesty. So you've got things that will mimic each other. Uh, you've got individuals that can perhaps grow different plumage so that they look a bit better than they actually are. Uh, one of the really good examples is the ruff. So that's a fairly, fairly small, smallish bird, uh, particularly in the UK, you get lots of ruffs. So the males, they're called ruffs because they've got this uh, lovely collar of feathers, like an Elizabethan ruff. 
So it, it's like that, and they, they grow that during the breeding season. So they look very different from the females, which are drab and brown. But you have got some males that adopt the female plumage. So it's almost like they're cross-dressing. They're pretending to be females. So then they get to hang out with the females, in amongst the females, and then they'll just sneakily jump on board and get a few matings in with the females. So there are these really weird and wonderful ways that sex has evolved in the animal kingdom. Yeah. So you've mentioned bright, colourful plumages in birds and things like that. The thing that comes to my mind is, is peacocks, but also birds of paradise, like watching David Attenborough programmes and the amazing dances and displays that they put on. Are there any examples of this where the roles are reversed, so it's the females that have the bright plumages and do that sort of thing? Ooh, there are examples. Uh, so with the, the plumage thing, obviously the plumage isn't a weapon. It's a different strategy. So you've got the males who've got the strategy of winning the females by just fighting the other males off. And then you've got males that are trying to impress the females by showing how amazing they are. So things like the peacocks producing their amazing tails, the birds of paradise. So it might be the way that they look or it might be something. So like the birds of paradise, they will often do a dance or they will um, get lots of berries and put them in a pile to attract the female. So there are things like gifting that the males can do. There are also bower birds. So they create these amazing platforms forms and stages which basically just a dance floor to show off to the females so it just makes them look even better for the females so that's another strategy instead of fighting it's less risky but it still often takes just as long to do things like build a bower or or clean their dance platform ready for the females to come along there are examples of females that have got the bright coloration as well uh, it, it's very few examples of this uh, things like females may tend to be bigger in some species or just a little bit brighter. There, isn't really, there aren't really very many examples where the female looks absolutely amazing and the male is really drab in comparison. That tends to be more, it, it's the males that are doing it. I can't think of any examples at the moment. I'm sure there will be loads, but right now I can't think of anything where I think, oh, the female looks absolutely amazing and the male's just drab. Usually it's the males that are trying to show off. The females are inherently beautiful, so they don't need to show off at all. It's the males <laughs> that have to. The one example that comes to my mind, I recently watched the first episode of Frozen Planet 2. I don't know if you've seen it, but there were... Um, I don't remember the exact species off the top of my head, but it was some sort of seal, I think. And to win a to win a female, they have this bubble in their nose that they blow out, and it's just the weirdest thing that I've seen. It's just it's almost it's quite disgusting, but it's just so fascinatingly odd. <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen that episode, so I've not seen that. But there are loads of different things, like um, the ring-tailed lemurs, the, the primates. It's the smelliest males that the females go for. That's really what they like. So if you're a really stinky male, then you're really attractive to a female. It, it's very <laughs> odd, the things that the females are, are going for. It's not all about the looks. No, not all about the looks, yeah. <laughs> We've kind of talked a lot about mammals and birds, and you mentioned the stag beetles. Um, are these sort of interesting behaviours also seen in other invertebrates or marine life? Yeah, so some of the marine life have got amazing behaviours. So uh, there's something called sequential hermaphroditism. Hermaphroditism? Hermaphrodites? Hermaphroditism. I'm not, I can't remember which one it is. <laughs> but this is where species will change sex over their lifetime. So they might start as a female and then turn into a male or start life as a male and turn into a female. So Nemo is one of the really good examples. So the clownfish. They start life as a male, and then when they get larger, they turn into a female. So I always used to joke with students that if ever there was a sequel to Finding Nemo, and, and there is now, but they should be calling it Finding Nemet because he would have turned into a female by that stage. <laughs> But you've got um, other things, there's the sheep's head wrasse and they start life as a female and then turn into a male when they're larger. So it's just different strategies that they adopt. 
but in terms of the invertebrates you have got the most amazing display of sexual selection beyond what you see in terms of the physical stuff so there's competition that you get between the males for access to females but then there's also competition that happens within the vaginal tract of the females and this is sperm competition so quite often you just assume right the males gained access to the female that's it he's going to be the father of the offspring but actually the females are not exactly as nice as humans often are so the females might put it about a bit they might be a little bit slutty so they will mate with lots and lots of males so that they're you know they're getting their fertility assurance and they've mated with a few dud ones but they've also mated with a few like the the johnny depps of the world and the brad pitt so the really gorgeous males and the males their sperm competes for access to the eggs so the competition just doesn't finish when they've gained access to the female. It's competition within the female tract as well. And the invertebrates have grown or evolved all sorts of weird and wonderful penises to take advantage of this sperm competition. So the dragonflies and the damselflies, those are the really famous ones. So the odonata, their penises are well I don't know if I would say absolutely amazing they're very weird uh, you've got ones that have got um, basically they might, might look at like hammers at the end so you've got ones that are, have evolved to push sperm from other males into the corners of the females so that bit of sperm isn't used you've got ones that have evolved with spikes on them to scrape out the sperm of other males you've even got ones with little whips on the end of them so that kind of whips out any sperm that have been stuck in the corners from other males gets that out of the way and then the actual male that's doing the mating at the time can use his sperm hopefully the female will get impregnated with his sperm because his sperm's there and other males sperm isn't great <laughs> is there a reason for species switching from male to female or from female to male like nemo like nemo uh, it seems to be related to the environment that they're living in and also to the different strategies that they're using so in the case of nemo we expect or we theorize that the males are turning into females because when they are larger, it means that the females are going to be more capable of producing more eggs and, and a lot more of them, so increasing their ability to reproduce and, and basically the number of offspring that they have. In the case of things like the sheep's head wrasse, then they are very territorial and if the males were all small they would find it difficult to compete with each other so when the female has basically produced lots of young then if she is larger when she's larger she will become a male so then she can fight off other males and then she can impregnate a whole load of females if she's the the top male and so she can really increase her her reproductive success uh -huh. that makes sense See, this is why Holly's course was better, Keris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't learn about this stuff. Well, I learned a little bit, but not tons. Do you know anything about the process of how they change from male to female? Because it, it sounds like it'd be quite complicated. Yeah, I would ask somebody who's much more into the physiology of species. It's something to do with the hormones. Um, I. I can't remember what the trigger is for the change in the hormone levels. It's the hormone levels that will um, change the individual from male to female or vice versa. I, I can't remember what the triggers are. I imagine they will be slightly different for each species. It might be to do with things like day length and light, if it's a, a yearly cycle, or for things which are much longer lived, then it might be in relation to their body size, or, or maybe something like the presence of other males in the area. So if you know there are gonna be lots of males, so maybe, I don't know, testosterone in the environment, then that would mean that you would possibly do better staying as a female for the moment. So yeah, I, I can't, I'm not sure of the trigger. Okay, that makes sense though. I feel like I remember something in my degree in one of your lectures that there were examples of homosexuality in the animal kingdom. Is that right? And can you give some examples? 
Yeah, yeah. Loads of examples of homosexuality in the animal kingdom, but it really depends on how you're defining homosexuality. So if you're defining homosexuality, because this is very much a, a human concept and we're deciding what homosexuality is, then you could say that individuals are essentially homosexual if they've engaged in a same-sex uh, copulation. Now, this might be almost a one-off, we might also define homosexuality as a long-term predisposition for members of the same sex. So it, it really depends on how you're defining it. Um, things like homosexuality, there are loads of examples in the animal kingdom. So lots of cases where you'll find males uh, undertaking sexual acts with males or females with females. Um, this tends to be uh, lots of the examples are in captivity. So this will be where there's been a restriction on possibly members of the opposite sex. So things like penguins, um, griffin vultures, they've all been found in captivity to rear eggs. So it's usually two males have been kind of forced together and then somebody's given them an egg and they've successfully raised it so they've become male parents. Uh, other examples, there was an example, oh gosh, it was in the Middle East somewhere, and it was two lions. So two male lions had been seen copulating together, and so everyone was suddenly, oh look, these are homosexual. But a lot of the time it's just because they've been pushed together. In the wild, you do get lots of examples of it, but it tends not to be long-term relationships. So it tends to just be something, so maybe if there aren't enough females around, or maybe if food is scarce, something like that, then you've got lots of examples of albatrosses that have perhaps engaged in a heterosexual relationship, but then you've had something like two males or two females raise an offspring together. So there are lots of different examples, but again, it depends how you're defining homosexuality. And then you've got things like the bonobos, which is a completely different thing altogether. So they use sex a lot. So do things like dolphins as a way of um, kind of maintaining social bonds. So sex is used almost as a, a submissive thing or as a dominance thing. So species like the bonobos, you've got males doing it with females, females with females, females with males, uh, threesomes happening, whole group orgies. <laughs> You've got everything going on there. Yeah, bonobos are, are, are pretty disgusting in terms of sex. <laughs> that was very interesting. And I just love the diversity. Just everything that you've spoken so far, it's just incredibly diverse and fascinating. Yeah, it's amazing how much uh, you see in the animal kingdom that's almost like mirrored in humans as well. Yeah, it's almost humans tend to think of themselves as above everything else and very unique, but uh, lots of that stuff is going on in the animal kingdom anyway. Okay, so you've talked a lot about um, competing for mates. And you've touched on the next process, I suppose, which is mating and different types of sperm that some animals have. You wrote an article for the conversation, which was called Kamikaze Sperm and Four-Headed Penises, The Hidden Ways Animals Win the Animal Kingdom. And I did have a look through and there are some very strange, but also quite fascinating examples in there. And I suppose I have two questions. One, what do you mean by Kamikaze Sperm? And then I suppose, could you give any more examples, if there are any, of species that have unusual sperm or penises? Oh, this is my favourite subject, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so kamikaze sperm is a, a term that was coined in relation to, well, there's a famous book called Sperm Wars. And this is kamikaze sperm, sperm that seems to actively seek out other sperm and kill it. So there's a bit of a debate as to whether this actually exists or not, but there is some evidence of it. Certainly there's a lot of evidence for abnormal sperm. So within the sperm of any organism, uh, about 20% of it is abnormal sperm. So it might have two heads or it might have two tails, it might have an elongated head, a very tiny tail, something like that. And there's been a lot of 
research actually looking at the sperm and what's the function of that sperm? Is it just mutated stuff that's not actually needed or is it needed and produced on purpose? So some schools have thought oh, that that kind of sperm is used for things like copulatory plugs. So it forms basically a chastity belt so that the females cannot possibly mate with anyone else they're all plugged up that's it <laughs> although there are ways of getting around this that males will use so pulling the plugs out or females are able to eject certain plugs and things like that um, but for the kamikaze sperm so this sperm this abnormal sperm may form these plugs or it may be present to actively go and hunt the sperm down of other males and kill it so there have been some really nice studies done um, on humans, actually. So there was a study on humans. Um, it was looking at males from the armed forces who'd been away from their female partner for certain lengths of time. And it seemed like the longer the males were away from the females, the higher proportion of abnormal sperm was in any ejaculate. So it, not necessarily related to, you know, you've got a larger ejaculate once you've been away from a female. That bit was all accounted for. So it was all to do with the proportion of the abnormal sperm. So the longer the male had been away, the more abnormal sperm there was. And the theory behind that is because the longer the male had been away, the increases, with the, the higher the chance that the females had done the dirty on the male, basically. So there was all, there's all of that lot involved in those studies as well. And I can't remember what your other questions were, Holly, sorry. Just other examples of species that have unusual sperm or penises. I know you've mentioned a few like the, the hammer head and the, the whip-like sperm and things like that, but is there anything else? Oh yeah, there are absolutely loads. Uh, so <laughs> you've got things like the barnacle, so the, the tiny, uh, like basically like a limpet, that has got an absolutely huge penis in relation to its body size. So these things are absolutely massive. They're just folded away most of the time. Uh, things like pigs have got a corkscrew shaped penis and the females have got a corkscrew shaped vagina as well to match it. Uh, <laughs> You've, you've got things which have got abnormally small penises and testes. So it tends to be monogamous species that have got the most basic or the small penises and small testes because they don't need to be involved in sperm competition. Things where you've got this polygamy happening, so where the females are mating with loads of different males, that's where you've got the evolution of these uh, weird and wonderful penises. There are even animals that have got two, essentially, penises. Only one of the penises generally produces sperm and actually works. But things like sharks are well known for having two penises. There is some evidence that they will use one of those penises basically a, as a jet watch. So they can take in uh, seawater and then expel it at high pressure. So it's thought that maybe they're using that to clean out the female before they start mating with her. Not because they think she's dirty, but to get rid of any other sperm that's in there. <laughs> um, another thing that I remember from one of your lectures just like it's just the weird the weird kind of lectures to do with this sort of thing <laughs> just stuck in my mind that um you mentioned that some penises have barbs and spines on them am i remembering this right and and why would this be yeah so you've got the barbed penises uh lots of organisms have got barbs of them or hooks or something like that uh, things like golden pottos they have got spines on their penises again it's because the females are, are are slags basically so they mate with many males and so the male wants to try and ensure that it's his sperm that gets used so the spikes on them are there to pull out the sperm from the female reproductive tract of any of the males that are in there yeah makes sense <laughs> <laughs> you also wrote another article for the conversation and there was an example that stood out that female spotted hyenas have a pseudo penis why is this 
Yeah, that's right. So it's the spotted hyenas. It doesn't seem to happen in the other hyena species, uh, but they're very much a female dominated society. So the females are dominant over all other males. So even the lowest female is generally dominant over the most dominant males. The females rule the roost with absolutely everything. They use the males uh, to produce sperm and then they impregnate them and, and that's basically it. The males aren't really used for anything else in their societies. Uh, so the females have actually developed a pseudo penis. So this is an enlarged or engorged clitoris but it actually it looks like a penis and they will use this to signal dominance and submission to each other so that they can see each other from quite a distance away. They're not using something like ornate plumage to signal dominance because that, that would really detract from their hunting ability when they're trying to capture prey or, or things like that or scavenge. Uh, and they've not got weapons because, again, the, the weapons would get in the way of things. So the females have evolved these enlarged clitorises and they can actually pump more blood into them, so essentially have an erection. So the females that are showing an erection are the ones which are the submissive ones. So they're saying, no, 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 you're the most dominant one. I'll, I'll stand back from this. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's an amazing thing. Um, I was in Kenya, just name dropping here, I was in <laughs> Kenya over the summer and I saw my first spotted hyenas in the wild and they are amazing, absolutely amazing. I was fascinated by them and I was trying to get a bit of footage of them so I could play it in my lectures and they'd they got the penises you could see the penises <laughs> so I was like oh wow this is brilliant so it was lovely and quiet and I was filming it I was with some students and they started going Louise look they've got their willies out like you've shown us like you told us about and I was going I'm trying to record this <laughs> so I'm going to have that in the background for all my lectures now with them shouting that <laughs> but they're really cool they're, they even um well, the, the nasty thing is that they still need to give birth through these. So they're giving birth through the pseudo penis, and it often splits for them to give birth through it. Yikes. Not nice. <laughs> no, but they're, they're pretty cool, yeah. Now that we've talked about finding a mate and mating, let's end with the, the rearing of offspring. So normally we'd think that the females would become pregnant, but this isn't always the case, as male seahorses are the ones that become pregnant. Um, is there a reason for this, and are there any other examples? Oh, good questions. Um, there are quite a few mouth-brooding cichlids. It seems to be largely um, fish species, where it's the males that are looking after the, the offspring. Uh, so the males become pregnant, it, usually it's the males that are um, inserting their sperm into the female for the female to become pregnant. In the case of the seahorses, it's almost the opposite way round. So it's not like the female suddenly produces sperm, but she inserts her eggs into the male and then they're fertilised. And then he's going to give birth, he's going to look after them all as well. Um, in things like, in cases like this, it depends on the, the systems of the animals. So if you've got organisms where the female's able to lay eggs and then just basically walk away, then the male can easily bring up those, those offspring. So things like the fish, the females can give birth possibly to live young, and then the males may, like the mouth brooding cichlids, they will brood them in their mouths and carry them round and protect them until they're large enough to then fend for themselves. So it's the males that do a lot of the work in those ones. Um, I did read a paper um, a couple of days ago that indicated that sometimes the males accidentally swallow some of those <laughs> children. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that just made me think, oh, oh dear. Um, but there's, there's lots of other cases where you've got males helping out. So although I joke that the males just do their business and go off, there's loads of cases where the males are equally involved. So egg-laying species, particularly as I've said, it can be the male that does 100% of the work or they can share equally. It's things like mammals that it's much harder for because it needs to be the female that's suckling the offspring and providing all the food for it. So that in that case, then, it's often the males are competing for access to the female and the female's putting in a huge amount of resources to raise an 
offspring. So uh, lots of the longer lived mammals, like the, the deer, then the females are involved for probably at least a year, if not two or more for different species in terms of nurturing those offspring yeah so so it depends on the life cycle of the individuals and it depends on the species and the environment and a whole load of things really you've mentioned males rearing and females rearing but are there any examples where the males and the females have as take as much responsibility in the rearing of young i imagine it could be in monogamous species where they produce it year after year after year yeah, yeah. The monogamous species, so the ones that form bonds for basically the duration of their life or un until their partner dies, they may, they may then take on another partner. Then it seems to be an equal proportion or more or less equal proportion. So uh, things, um, one of my uh, colleagues, Esther Kettle, so we've studied peregrine falcons together a lot and she did a lot of studies looking at the male feeding compared to the female feeding so the female will do more in terms of brooding the chicks when they're younger and the male tends to be the one that hunts and brings the food back but when they get a bit older it's equal male and female bringing the food back for the offspring what we did notice in one of the studies that we did was that the male will feed all chicks so he'll just feed them all randomly whereas the female seemed to notice one year that one of the chicks was a runt and it wasn't going to make it so she then started feeding the other chicks in preference and leaving the one that was clearly not going to make it so there are some you know really quite small differences between the males and females that might impact on their breeding success but yeah it's these longer lived ones where you've got the males and females taking on equal roles or sharing the roles like the male brings the food back because the female is going to be suckling the offspring or something you've also got a few species where the male and the female basically don't take any part in the rearing of their own offspring so these tend to be the cooperative breeding species where the male and the female are essentially just breeding machines so i'm thinking about things here like the meerkats so the dominant female the dominant male will generally produce offspring and then the females will suckle them for a small amount of time. Then once they're independent, it's the rest of the clan that will take over the nurturing. So helping the youngsters to learn how to search for food and they will babysit them and things like that. Whilst the male and the female get on with producing their next litter. So there are lots of um, examples like that. I think probably the really extreme examples are where you've got eusocial species. So where you've got drones, things which are never going to reproduce themselves. So uh, Hymenoptera, bees, ants, wasp species, you've got the queen and her role is just to keep reproducing, reproducing, reproducing. So she's fertilized by a male and then she basically, it depends on the species, but quite a lot of those females will just be fertilized by one male and that's all she needs. One mating, she's gonna keep reproducing and reproducing and reproducing. And her first generation of offspring are all born to be helpers. So they're just going to help her to raise those offspring. So she's going to give birth to eggs or larvae and they're going to nurture them. They're going to find food for them. And then they're going to work to, to make everything a bit bigger and bigger. So you've got really extreme examples there where the male and female are helping. And then when the male and female are just having nothing to do with their offspring at all. Going back to the peregrine falcons, another reason why Nottingham Trent University is great is that normally there's a pair of breeding falcons on top one of the buildings and I didn't keep up to date with the progress this year did they come back to the building this year and produce any offspring yes they came back to the building I think they managed two offspring this year although there has been a bit of a drama recently so we've had um, in conjunction with Nottingham Wildlife Trust uh, we uh, put a breeding platform up on the Newton building so that's in Nottingham city centre because the birds had started to show an interest and we, we just thought it'd be safer for them and then we put cameras up so the cameras are on them 24 hours a day 365 days of the year so the cameras are on there you can go on the website right now and have a look so if you just do a search for NTU Falcon 
you should find the link to, to the page. So they're always there, but things really hot up from kind of February onwards. Uh, we had a pair, they weren't ringed, so we can't be sure, but the female has got a really distinctive um, long end to her beak. So she had been around for a huge amount of time. So she was kind of called Mrs P, and then there was a male Mr P, who may have changed over the duration. But then one year, Mr P uh, was um, got rid of by another male. So a young male came in. He had got uh, a leg ring on, so an orange leg ring. Anyway, he's called Archie based on the ring that he had on. And we could work out that he came from a nest in London. So I think it was like the Parliament pair, their nest. Uh, so he came in and, and took over and he bred successfully with Mrs P for a few years. Uh, and then two years ago, Mrs P had laid a couple of eggs and then all of a sudden you can see, you can go back through some of the footage and you can see she's getting really upset and squawking. And it's because this new female has come along. So this new female comes along, you see her dive bomb and then Mrs P goes off to chase her off. Unfortunately, Mrs P died. Nobody's quite sure how. It might be that the new peregrine was um, had a fight with her, but maybe the new peregrine came in and then because of her coming in, Mrs P uh, crashed into a building or maybe got caught in some traffic or something like that. But she died and the new female took over. So um, the, the, the uh, students, all, there was a bit of a of a poll to see what the new female was going to be called. Um, I, I can't remember, uh, P9 I think is just her name now based on the ring. So we've found out that she's also come from London and happens to be Archie's niece, but it doesn't seem to be putting them off trying to breed. <laughs> so they're breeding together now, but the students really wanted to call her Jolene. <laughs> because she kind of came <laughs> along and, and stole Mrs P's man. But it, she's been on the scene for a couple of years now. So the first year she was there, uh, she laid two eggs as well. So Archie and Jolene uh, were incubating four eggs, two of which belonged to Mrs P and two belonged to Jolene. Only one of those hatched and we're not sure which egg it was that hatched. And then last year she laid a few eggs and a couple of them hatched. So. Archie and Jolene are, are relatively new, but I imagine in a few years' time they'll be laying sort of four or five eggs, which is what Mrs P was, was more well-known for. She was a good breeder, yeah. Amazing. We can put the, the link to the, to the live stream in the description if anyone wants to, to watch it. I want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it is brilliant. Everyone gets really engrossed in it, yeah. Sort of February onwards. So they're there at the moment, so you will see them if you watch, but often they're round the other side of the building, so that's where they tend to be a lot of the year. They only come round to the nesting area when, it, when it's time to nest, but you'll see them in February start doing things like... Um, checking out the nest site they'll be bowing to each other to to say you know let's get ready and then you probably see them mating you'll see them laying the eggs incubating feeding the young you'll see the males bringing the food back yeah a huge number of stuff you'll see on it that's brilliant <laughs> if a male comes along um does that happen with birds as well like will they smash up eggs or anything do you know oh um so it wouldn't surprise me at all they haven't got the same kind of sense of smell as things like the mammals have uh but in bird species i've definitely seen if another species wants to come in and, and use a nest they will often kill the bird that's in the nest already to 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 breed themselves. So I've seen that, um, I was out in Sweden for a bit on Gotland doing a study on great tits out there and the flycatchers who are out there, so it was collared uh, flycatchers, they are very, very much um, subordinate to the great tits and they will start to breed first. So there are a few cases where the, the collared flycatcher had started nesting in a nest box and then the great tit had come along and was just, no, this is where I want to nest, get out. And often if the flycatcher wouldn't get out of its own accord, then 
the great tid would come and, and basically cave its head in. So the um, the Swedish name for the great tid, uh, it's something like Taluxa, and it translates as butcher bird because they will butcher other birds and be, yeah, it's not very nice behaviour. <laughs> yeah, it, it's something that happens because they're so in need of breeding. This is where I want to breed. This is where I think I'll be able to produce the most offspring. So it certainly happens between different species. It wouldn't surprise me if it happened within a species at all. Yeah. That reminded me of something else. How is it cuckoos where they lay their eggs in other species nests and they just like leave them for the other species to rear them. And it's like massively different in sizes and they don't even notice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So quite a lot of the time, um, there's lots of studies on birds because birds are pretty stupid. They can't smell differences in things, whereas mammals would go mad. And sometimes they they just have a certain image in their head. So it can be uh, some sort of super stimulant, which will just mean that they will just be feeding something, whether it is what they're supposed to be feeding or not. But cuckoos, yeah, they've evolved this amazing... Um, amazing behavior where they have absolutely nothing to do in terms of looking after their offspring so they will just find a nest of a bird uh, there are certain birds which they tend to cook old a bit more than others so things like reed warblers are very common in the uk so the cuckoo will lay its egg in a reed warbler nest and the difference in size between a, an adult cuckoo and an adult reed warbler they're, they're kind of probably a, a quarter of the size of the cuckoo and the cuckoo lays its egg, and then when the baby cuckoo hatches out, it's born with this whole load of innate behaviours. So it's come with these pre-programmed behaviours where it's going to try and get rid of all of its competition in the nest. So if there are any reed warbler chicks in the nest, it will gradually push them over the side of the nest so they plummet to their death. So you've just got this one cuckoo being left. And then the male and female, the parent reed warblers, will come and feed it because they just see cheap, 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 and they've got this super stimulus, so they just keep feeding and feeding. So you end up with these ridiculous photos of these parents which are a quarter of the size of this giant big fat <laughs> baby sat in the nest. But it means that the cuckoos, the parents... It's risky because they don't know what's going to happen, but also at the same time, they're saving all of their energy by not having to raise their offspring. Well, it must be working if they keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Where can anyone listening go if they want to learn more about some of the topics we've covered here today? obviously come and do a degree at Nottingham Trent. <laughs> um, loads of places uh, so online places like the Wildlife Trusts uh, will be able to help in terms of things like peregrine webcams or going to find cuckoos or anything like that. Uh, if you're more interested in things like sex and power in the animal kingdom there are some great books out there so uh, there's a book called Bitch which is out uh, that's absolutely brilliant it's all about female dominated societies uh, there's also a book one of my favorites called uh, Dr Tatiana's sex advice to all creation so Holly you'll remember this from our lectures this is basically written like an agony aunt so one of the things in there is oh my boyfriend's a, a beautiful golden potto but he's got enormous spines all over his penis why is this the case and then she explains and gives an answer but it's all to do with scientific theory so there are loads of books out there like that there's a book called sperm wars that, yeah loads of stuff and uh, pieces that people write like me for the conversation so that does a lot of really great science communication making science more accessible to members of the public <laughs> So here on Nature Positivity, we like to end our episodes with our nature highlights of the week. Louise, let's hear yours. Do you have a nature highlight? My nature highlight of the week was just seeing um, a buzzard really, really close. So I think at this time of year, quite often you'll disturb things. Uh, so I was out on a dog walk and the dog had obviously got a little bit close. But the buzzard came and swooped down. It, it was absolutely silent and was probably maybe a metre on top of me so really close and just went across from one tree to another and that that kind of thing it's it's quite common to see it's a common bird it's nothing like oh wow that's a, a bright bird of paradise doing a display but that kind of thing <laughs> just still makes me think wow 
Yeah, definitely. It's not often that you get to see them that close, though. I often see them just hovering or flying about in the sky, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah like tens of metres above you, mm-hmm. yeah. What about you, Karis? I was in London the other week and went for a walk through Hyde Park and I was kind of surprised at how much, like, greenery and wildlife there was, um, like, in the centre of London. Like, there's so many different ducks and birds and things. I, I don't know what they were all called, like, the species, but that was my highlight, like, seeing all the different things, even in a big city. What about you, Holly? I've kind of got one main one and an extra one. So Ooh. my main one was that myself and my family went on a, an, a dusk walk the other day, and we tend to just do this in late autumn, winter time when it gets dark earlier. So we go out around 3, 4 p.m., generally to look at the Christmas lights, but obviously they're not really on at the moment. But we just went a walk around the area, ended up in the local nature reserve. It was pitch black when we arrived in the in the nature reserve, but I was with other people, so it was fine. But that in itself was quite exhilarating, walking through a wood that you know so well, but it's so dark that it just looks completely different. Um, but yeah, just starting this year's dusk walk tradition was a highlight. Um, and then... Another one is that after this podcast, I will be, it's not really naturey, but I'll be submitting my final assignment for my master's degree. So that's very exciting. And I thought it was worth celebrating on the podcast. <laughs> Definitely. We, um, we discussed a little bit about what Holly's dissertation was about in the last episode. So if you're intrigued, you can go and listen. So my, well, I didn't have a cup of tea, but I imagine your hot drinks are all gone, which must mean it's the end of the episode. Thank you so much, Louise, for talking with us about some of the weird but very fascinating things that happen in the animal kingdom. Aw, thanks Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And if you enjoyed it, please consider giving Nature Positivity a follow and a review, but preferably a good one, as it really helps us spread the word about the podcast. We will put the links to Louise's articles from the conversation and the link to the Peregrine Falcon live stream in the description of this episode. Don't forget to follow us on social media. You can find the details in this description. And keep an eye out for our next episode. Thanks again, Louise, for joining us today. And thank you for listening to Nature Positivity. Thank you.